and it will mostly be about, be about the so-called irrelevant vertex approach to this problem. This is joint work uh, with Isolde Adler, Stavros Kaliopoulos, Daniel Okshanov, Saket Zaurab, and Dimitros Tilikas. Um, the talk will mostly give like a more high-level overview of what we did, and um, I will give a little bit more details on the blackboard at some places, and if you have questions, just ask, then I can go into more details of individual parts. Okay, so first I will introduce the problem, then speak about our results, which uh, consist of an upper bound, both of runtime for the algorithm and of certain important boundary functions in the relevant vertex approach, then we'll give a lower bound, so to show that essentially what we uh, got as upper bound is a quite a tight bound, and then I'll conclude. Okay, so what's the disjoint pass problem? Well, um, given a graph and k pairs of terminals, we want to decide if there are vertex disjoint paths connecting the endpoints of the pairs of terminals. Then a simple example would be like uh, we have node S1, T1, S2, T2, and there's some graph in between, maybe like this. And uh, in this case, there's no solution because um, we would need to connect S1 to T1, and uh, any way to do so would block the way from S2 to T2. But let's say if there was another edge, like this one, then we would have a solution namely one pass connecting S1 to T1 and a disjoint pass connecting S2 to T2. Well, even if them, so I didn't really draw it as planar, it still is a planar graph. So this is on one hand an interesting problem because it has important applications in theory and the graph minor series of paper. It also does have um, practical applications, like in VLSI routing or printed circuit board design. And the uh, famous approach um, is a so-called relevant vertex approach. Um, basically, this approach was uh, first pioneered by uh, Robertson and Seymour in 1995. Um, it goes like this, um, we look at the graph, if a certain structural condition of the graph, typically something like low trees, is met, we use it to solve the problem. If it is not met, we find a so-called irrelevant vertex in the graph. Irrelevant vertex means um, the problem has a solution on the original graph exactly if it has a solution on the graph with this one vertex removed. So we can record this approach, like um, we get a graph, okay, the structural condition is not met, find an irrelevant vertex, remove it, do it again, remove, remove, remove. At some point we will have removed enough vertices that the structural condition is met, and then we can solve it like with a dynamic programming approach on 3D compositions or something. So Robson and Zimmer got uh, a runtime, which is cubic in the size of the graph, and um, has this uh, factor which is constant for a constant parameter, number of terminal pairs, still a computable function, but this f is really huge. So um, this approach is not practical in any way, and um, even for theoretical things, it's not really nice to have this um, F of which we basically only know it's computable, and that's it. There was an, an improvement by Kenichi, Kawara, Bayashi, and uh, Peter Wong in 2010. Um, 
basically of the simplification of the original uh, proof by um, Robertson and Sigler. And um, this also led to an improvement in runtime in particular. They found uh, bound on F, um, it is still bigger than, somewhat bigger than this uh, small tower of exponentiations now, but not much bigger. So it's not really explicit in the proof what the F would be, but it is clear that it's not much bigger than uh, this, and uh, in particular much better than the old F was. Still, it's, it's, it's quite big. So one would want to improve it further. And um, for doing so, we look at kind of a restricted case, case namely the planar one. So now the graph is planar. So as the same, we have k pairs of terminals, which are nodes in the graph. We want to decide if there's k vertexes shine paths with matching endpoints. And uh, our result is now that we can using the old and vertex approach, get this double exponential one time, and a strong indication that um, the old and vertex approach cannot do better. Basically, um, the one, expo one exponentiation comes from the size of the graph. For that one, we get a nearly exact uh, lower bound as well, and the other one comes from uh, going via the three decompositions, so it's kind of inherent in the, in the real and vertex approach. Okay, a bit more available uh, formulation of these results is um, that there is a constant, constant C such that every n vertex planar graph G with three versus at least C to the power of K contains an irrelevant vertex. And on the other hand, we have an, an example for the lower bound. Uh, there is one instance of the discharge pair pro pass problem, discharge pass problem on a graph of single exponential trees that has a unique solution that uses all the vertices of G. So there is no irrelevant vertex in other words. Okay, let's start with the upper bound. Basically, the big picture goes like this. If the tree base is large, then we have a large grid in the graph. Now a large grid is equivalent to some other things. In particular, it is equivalent to a large mole. So a graph like this and also to a large number of concentric circles, which means uh, there's a graph which looks like this. Because, I mean, if I have a large grid, I can, like, uh, take these things to get the circles or um, skip them to get this small like thing. So I can use uh, in the proof, uh, basically, whatever I like of this. If the tree is large, we have this, we have this, we have this. There's a large subgraph that looks like this. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, there also may be, like, more vertices, so this means thing may be subdivided. And uh, what we <coughs> this um, mostly is uh, that we have lots of so-called tight concentric circles, so this is this concentric circle theory, and we also say we choose a middle, and then the circle should, should be tight, which means uh, that it cannot be like this and edge like this. Uh, once we have a plane graph and really an internal plane, we then we choose as the next uh, circle the innermost one, so in this case we would choose this one, and then it would look like basically this. So we only also so have like uh, one vertex in the middle, the mole, and then we take the loop uh, around it that is closest to it and call it C1, C2, C3, and so on. 
I mean, I can trust two. So, so I can simply say that. <coughs> if I then say, um, the solution to the just turn path problem has a cost. And cost then basically is uh, when the path enters such a circle, I mean, like this, or leaves it, or also like this. So, so all the times when, when a solution of the path enters one of those uh, circles, there's a certain cost. And then we say, okay, we now look at a cheap solution. So here we say, okay, there's a large grid, then there's a large concentric circles, we choose the median uh, vertex outlines, and then, of course, there, then the other, if there's a solution, then there's a so-called cheap solution, namely the one which has uh, the least number of edges that enter or leave these circles. And then we say, okay, for this cheap solution, we prove certain properties that will help us in finding the relevant vertex. Okay. So, um, we now take uh, this disk from the outermost concentric circle. And then um, look at how the path from the solution may traverse this disk. Okay, um, we call these uh, parts of the path of the solution that go through this disk segments. And uh, basically they go from one end, uh, from one uh, point on the outermost circle to the other one. And um, as the color already indicates, um, they are of different types. Namely, they form like this kind of parallel bundles, and um, we call them of the same type if intuitively you also have a more formal definition. They are like uh, these parallel things here. So there's like uh, no, uh, nothing else in between. In particular, these two here would be of the same type if there's no other parts of the solution in between, but if there would be something like this, they would all be different types. And then to bound the total number of segments, which we want to do to find a relevant vertex, we on one hand bound the number of segment types and then bound the number of segments per type. So, to balance the number of segment types, <coughs> we uh, look at this thing we call the segment dual graph. So, basically, we treat each segment type as a single edge, and then make a kind of dual graph, which is a bit different at the, the least, but otherwise, over every segment type, we have an edge, and the leaves uh, correspond to these so-called tongue tips, which means types that uh, just go a bit inside the surface uh, disk, um, but do not go over any other thing, so there's no other type uh, under it. And for then we take the segment dual graph and we can show, okay, um, it has a minimum number uh, degree 3, and uh, because, I mean, if there would be a vertex with degree 2, there would be in um, this scenario, so two parallel things, and they would be of the same type, so that cannot happen, degree 2. So the minimum degree is 3, and uh, when there's a minimum degree of 3, then uh, the total number of, of edges is bounded by about two times the number of leaves in the tree. And that is what we use. So we only need to find the bound on the number of the leaves in this graph, which corresponds to a bound on the number of these tongue tip types. That's one thing. Um, if you're interested in that, I can go into more detail on that later. But for now, I want to proceed with a bound on the number of segments per type which basically go 
also exist if we have many segments of the same type. Then in this segment, we can find like a, a sub part of the segment. So that every pass of the solution occurs an even number of times in this uh, sub part of the segment. And uh, this even number of times allows us uh, to do rerouting by basically uh, taking parts of the solution that would be outside of the segment, mirroring them inside, and reducing the total number of edges inside. In this case, like this. Obviously, this can result in a cheaper solution. And it, no, not that obviously, but it can result in a cheaper solution, in particular because it has less edges, but you can also show that it doesn't go as deep into these concentric circles as the other thing. And um, that means, um, since we assume the cheap solution, that this case cannot happen because there's a cheaper one. Basically, we do the, what happens here, and what is in, important in the proof is that this uh, outer graph thinks that we mirror to the inside our planar outside, and that way, that's where we can mirror it to the inside, and they are still planar. And then in the inside, the inside is a large grid, so we can really find the uh, edges to route these paths in the inside of the large grid. So that's uh, like the big picture of the upper bound, which then allows us to say, okay, at most about the exponential, so number of uh, vertices, and then double exponential runtime for an irrelevant vertex approach. So now the lower bound, it's quite simple because there is an example. So um, it was a Clement and Esmond formula. Um, we have this pair of vertices, T1, S1, a grid. We place T at the right of the middle, S on the left of the middle. And then we basically go on by placing S2 at the middle point between the uh, upper left corner and uh, S1, and then we curse, so S3 is at the middle point between S2 and there, and then S4 finally makes it to the left corner, so always like a little bit up above the middle, because the direct middle would be like here, and there's no node, so above. So again, it would be here, okay, above, and uh, yeah, that one would be here, so above. And uh, basically, the corresponding T is always, except for the very first one, which is on the other side, mirrored um, at the last S. So this T2 is basically S2 mirrored at S1, and T3 is basically S3 mirrored at S2, and T4 is S4 mirrored at S3 which gives us this graph, which does have a unique solution, and since it contains a big grid, it has large trees and everything, and the unique solution uses all vertices. So the proof um, using a topological argument, basically, now, um, this is again our grid, the circle, this um, Marked areas are areas where there's no edges, like uh, near to the left of S1, there are no edges in this plane. Near S4, near T, uh, T0, uh, S0, there's none. So these are there marked. So basically, we have to somehow connect S4 to T4 in a resolution, which simplest way seems to be like this. Could be another way, but it has to go inside this script somehow, or at least go at the edge of the grid. But on the other hand, we also have to connect S3 to T, T3. Now, and uh, since this connection between S3 and T3 blocks any path from S4 to T4 inside the grid, it means from T4 we have to go through the grid, outside the grid, and through the grid again. And then because the solution could be even more complex, it could go like, like this, 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 Together, but uh, this uh, generator means that we have to do it at least. Go through it outside and through the grid once again. And the same way happens with S2 to T2. We have to pull like uh, the whole thing we had like here around T2 this way. And again, 
is S1 to T1 and uh, at that point it is then becomes clear that in the original graph uh, the only solution I mean we have to go, everything has to go around T1 so on this side and the solution is unique so to compute our result there is a constant the exponential triggers gives us an irrelevant vertex that gives us a double exponential runtime for solving the discharge pass problem because the trigger is a single exponential and we can using standard uh, dynamic broken approaches then find something that is single exponential in the triggers so total double exponential and we have this um, uh, square part from the relevant vertex approach itself that find always find the relevant vertex and remove it basically by finding a big grid that has no terminals inside I mean I always assume that the terminal for outside that's not a difficult not a problematic assumption because if you have a big, really big grid then I mean there are few terminals so um, if you like subdivide your grid into many subgrids you will I mean the terminals can only be in some of them because there's not enough terminals for all of them so the, the grid without terminals inside it is not a problem we will find it and on the other hand we have this instance on a again single exponential previous planar graph that has a unique solution that uses all vertices which gives a strong indication that a substantial improvement in runtime will require a different technique okay so that's a favorite picture now um, of course I can go into details of parts you're interested in but uh, let's start with questions Maybe I forgot to tell you that the talk is about uh, one hour, but... <laughs> oh, yeah, they told me at one time it was one hour, and they assumed uh, 30 minutes talk, 30 minutes uh -huh. discussion, because uh, uh, that's uh, common uh, and uh, nice uh, in uh, 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 five uh, minutes, uh, but uh, uh, still. So I'm, I'm supposed to talk for one hour, and then the no, no, discussion? Yeah, so okay. But anyway... Maybe it mm. could be beneficial if you explain, I mean, some people didn't know the grid theorem for trivets. I mean, like grid and trivets, so you could uh, uh, explain a little bit about the grid theorem and trivets and how they are okay. related to your proof. Well, basically, um, we, we just use this uh, two theorems. Um, if the trivets is large, there's a large grid. And the other relatively obvious way, if there's a large grid, then the trivial is large. Um, we just leave it that way. There's uh, no, no really in-depth uh, thing we do there. We say we have the large grid and we use it. Yeah. So this is the case here. Really yeah. that. Because when you want to get this to like the um, well, if it comes from, um, well, it is this, um, is it, the upper hand, I mean, um, this thing here gives us, uh, this way we found the uh, bound on the number of segment types, segments per type, which again gives us a bound on the maximum size of the grid there could be, because we can say if the grid is big, so we do this, so that's that many segments and then the next step is okay if there's not that many segments then uh, the largest vertex of the of the concentric cycles is not used or at least there is a solution that does not use the usual vertex and um, from the size of the grid again we can go to this uh, c to the power of k in the trivials so maybe I should uh, go into a little bit, I uh, don't know, first few the questions, but then I could go into a little bit more detail on, on these things. I mean, I just to show the pictures and that a few words, but um, I think it could be interesting to see how we like the, how we bound the number of tongue tips and such.
But as long as there's questions, I'll answer them first. So what would be the crucial difference between the Lobson Seymour's result of the strength pass problem and uh, your, so what's the new ingredient? Or, I mean, well, um, or there my date must have uh, difficulty because it's non-planner, right? Yes, so that is more general. So their result is on general curves, while ours is restricted to Boolean curves. And they have evaluated in both the binding num, the bound on the number of segment types and the binding the number of segments per type. We use planarity. I mean, I explained here that uh, for this mirroring the outside part inside, we use that it's kind of outside. And also in this bound on the number of talk tips, we use planarity. I think it can be generalized to bounded chairs. And uh, can you chair? Uh, I was working on a lemma that uh, will allow us to generalize uh, from disjoint path problem to uh, minors uh, with uh, fixed mapping from uh, vertices of the minor to vertices in the graph, which on one hand is more closer to application than on the other hand um, will basically, if both things work and can be combined, be a replacement for the graph minor 7 uh, result, um, but will be a shorter proof and with an explicit bound on the runtime. Do you have any other questions? Uh, is the lower bound for any algorithm? Do you miss that? I don't know. It's not a lower bound for any algorithm, but it's a lower bound on... Um, yeah, sorry. I confused the two. A uh, lower bound on uh, when there is mirror than vertex. Which means it's basically, it, it gives a strong indication that there is a lower bound for any algorithm based on the irrelevant vertex approach. There could be others, but uh, so far the irrelevant vertex approach seems to have always been the best, um, but um, it will probably not do better than that. Because large grids really reside in, in not only large trees, but also for other, many other graph parameters like rank width and so on, uh, get large if there's a large grid inside. So by going planar, you remove, if I follow it correctly, two, two levels in the tower of power, the two. Yes. Uh, do you have anything about uh, the constant in the. Uh, you want to see? Yeah, the uh, that was in the summary. I have to look it up, I don't know it by heart, <laughs> but it uh, might be an explicit. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, basically the result um, that um, if the tree is is uh, bigger than bigger than this, then we can uh, find an irrelevant vertex. <laughs> so it's basically two and then this polynomial factor which you can easily put into like 2.1 to the power of k. Yeah, so that's on the lower bound. No, no, no. So this is uh, the upper bound thing. Upper if the tree base is larger than this, uh -huh. then there is an irrelevant vertex. Um, so this uh, lower bound, um, it is as in the, in the example shown, uh, um, so, so basically 2 to the power of k. Let me see if it was a constant. Um, yeah, it's, it's, we have this uh, 2 to the power of k minus 1 for the lower bound. Yeah, let's put it here next to it. So, so there's a, it would be, and it will be still, and these are quite tight bounds for this thing, especially considering that the old bounds are power of exponentiations here. Yeah. 
Uh, so how time is going to be uh, two to this on both sides. So this the first statement doesn't really tell you about the running time of finding relevant vertex, right? That's all. Um, I mean, no. That, 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 that finding the relevant vertex is fast. That's uh, the, the, the square one. So the big part comes from whatever remains uh, in the tree with once we can no longer find an irrelevant vertex using our approach. Yeah, so once you remove a lot of uh, relevant vertices, you end up having graphs of small trees. Yes. And, and small in this case means like this. <laughs> yeah. So you get a graph of trees and most of them number. Yes. And then you might use dynamic programming to solve the problem. Yes. Uh, so in that case, you also know that the running time as a two, I mean, and there will be running time for solving DPP for graphs of small trees. Yes. And that one will be two, that will be two to the power of this times n. Uh -huh. So standard dynamic programming. Okay. Okay, further questions? <laughs> so has this been studied before, the special case of planar graphs? Um, honestly, I don't know much about that. <laughs> But I don't think uh, there's a better result than the one by uh, Ken Ichi um, mm -hmm. for general graphs for the planar case. So you say you uh, you're trying to generalize this to graphs from bounded genus. Yes. And for planar case, there's a theorem saying that if true is big in terms of as a linear function of k, you get a some k by k grid. Yes. Like for non-planar case, that the size of grid you get by having large trees is worse, right? You get only a smaller grid. I think, but I don't think that uh, will be much of a problem. Uh, for for now, um, um, the, the hard part for the bounded trees, I think, is bounding the number of segments per type. I think uh, this one will be easy to do for binary genus, so we'll basically we will only get like uh, uh, a polynomial factor from the binary genus in the upper part. Could even be that, uh, no, I think uh, it will even do that, like just uh, one of the case will repla re be replaced by uh, k plus genus. So that should be harmless, but, but this part here, um, can uh, uh, can she think it is doable? Mm -hmm. um, I think it is doable, but I haven't found out how yet. Isolde worked for some time on it and didn't uh, find uh, a solution, but I think uh, this bound uh, is, a, is a one hard thing uh, for, for going to bound the genus. So could you please explain the next slide that we use planning? Or maybe, so yeah, yeah. Could you explain again I'm going, if I do in this situation, I, well, I cannot do in this situation because this one would do the same and is cheaper. It's a basic argument, and um, it goes like this. If there's a segment type where there's many segments inside, then we know it's enough belong to, to pass off the solution. Otherwise, it wouldn't be there. So these are the colors in here, like blue is the pass from S1 to and so on. And if we think this is big enough, then there is a sub part such that every pass that occurs in here occurs in even number of times. Um, like in this scenario, so we have an even number of blue one uh, segments, an even number of green ones, uh, an even number of red ones. And uh, that then allows us to 
will basically do this rerouting step, which essentially just moves uh, the parts that were outside. Uh, sorry. Inside, so basically we go from from here we don't do this, we basically skip to the next one, which means we take this thing and move it up here, we take this thing, move it down here. The red one would then let's say zoop zoop would then be replaced by this because the this outer part goes in here and this, which results in this diagonal line, and so on. And um, the interesting thing is on the one hand, it is possible to do it topologically, which means it's still planar because basically we've taken the outside planar graph and put it inside. That's one point. And the other thing um, we then have to prove is that uh, using the sufficiently large grid concentric cycles, well, etc., you can really find vertices in the edges to realize these inside the grid. Yes, that one would be hard because we would not have this outside this planner and therefore it goes inside. Mm -hmm. So you would have to Yeah. The current idea is to try to find like some to again say, okay, this thing is big. Then we try to find two winding curves which are homotopic to each other and two homotopic curves in a surface is a bound to zero by a numerous bond and within that one then to continue. But um, I've been thinking about it, I sometimes thought I had the solution to it, but then there was always a flaw, so I'm, um, I'm not sure yet, but, but uh, both me and Kevin she think that that should be the way to do it. Okay, but, but this, uh, yeah, this part is uh, one. Yeah. And then polarity is also used in, in in the bound and the number of segment types, but there um, I know how I could do it uh, for bounded genus, basically by, by cutting. So until I'm in a Brenner case, and then I think I'll just get, a, a re get to replace a K by K plus 2G or K plus G or something. Okay, further questions? Then, unless no one is interested in it, I will talk a bit on how to bounce the number of segment types. Which I said we do by bounding the number of tongue tips. Because we can go there as a dual graph, and then we want to, in the dual graph, we want to bound the leaves, and the leaves correspond to tongue tips here. So, tongue tips, again, uh, just to repeat, um, are these segment types that have no other segment type under them. So these ones, these are tongue tips, this one, this one, this one is one, this one is one, this one is one, while these two are not. Um, yeah. Basically, um, we look at these uh, tongues and um, first we skin them. We call them all these tongue tips, it basically looks like this. And then we can say, okay, there's one. So these are parts of paths of the solution. And again, there is one that is only on the outermost cycle. Because we said we have a cheap solution. So they are like um, going to the to, to the more uh, cycles are touched, the more expensive it gets. And assuming there is one here, I mean we wouldn't have to do this, we could have gone from here to here directly. So uh, in any case it means there is one innermost. Well outermost from the perspective of the cycles, but innermost from the perspective of the tongue tip part. So for 
again in the number of time taps, I want to balance the number of these uh, instances of just touching the outer circle, circle and then going out again. For that, I classify them basically into different types. So type 1 is the easy one. Okay. Um, I mean, this we uh, we classify them based on where these paths that are attached go. So type 1 is the easy one. In that case, they just go directly to terminals without entering our disk again. Next type would be, okay, the, this happens on one side, like directly to a terminal here, but we re-enter the disk on the other side, like this, or like this. And then we have the type 3, where both ends will enter the disk. So, like this, and then it can go any way further, or like this. These three types. And then the idea is um, to say, um, the number of, of uh, these things by the number of terminals. So basically, we take our graph and then imagine a it that like remove such a thing and remove the terminal at the same time. And in the end, one terminal will remain, so we can say, okay, the number of these time tips was at most, at least one terminal will remain, was at most the number of uh, Terminals minus one. Um, the algorithm goes like this. So, I mean, this one is just harmless. Yeah, if it, everything would be like this, and you could say, okay, we have at most uh, half as many time tips as terminals, and these ones are also easy because we would only have this type, this type. We could always like, okay, this will be map this one to the terminal, and this one always to the terminal they are attached to, and they are attached to. What gets complicated is this here, because it could happen that in such a case we have this uh, time tip, this time tip, and this time tip, and then they are connected like this, and like this, and like this, and it's not, it's not always clear uh, which, I mean, we don't see any terminals here now, which terminals we should map them to. Um, so for that, we use uh, lambda that says that if we have something like this, there's a terminal underneath. I mean, that, that's relatively intuitive, because then, as I said before, we are then uh, subtracting and entering it as expensive, so there must be a reason to not directly connect it here. And uh, that reason is that, well, there's another path here, basically this one. It's a bit more of, of arguments involved, but um, the intuition is that one. So it has to be a terminal, because otherwise we could do it on a shorter path. And then we know, okay, these are these terminals underneath here. And uh, then we can try to either like map uh, these representatives to terminals, and um, then we have to be careful that um, there's always enough represented, uh, enough terminals remaining. Like in this scenario, um, I mean, I didn't draw a terminal here or here. Um, and then, I mean, it could be like this. And then there's lots of other things here with the representatives at the end, and uh, then there would be not enough terminals. So we need uh, to make sure that there will be enough terminals and remove them in a smart way. Basically, it's an algorithm that and as I said, it always takes such a, such a time tip and a terminal removes them and um, we define when the representative is available for this algorithm. Um, 
um, like this type is always available, this type also, and uh, these types are available if there's no other representative, uh, no other tongue tip, because these things representative, these uh, outermost part of the uh, tongue tips, or innermost, depending on how you read them, if there's no, no other under here, and no other under here, and um, there's one end, so there's no other on the other side, and then you have to prove that there will always be an available one, basically, that one is done by constructing a multigraph out of these type 3 things, and um, then, per, and, uh, then you can apply, basically say, um, assuming that there would be no available uh, one, but there are still others left, then we get a contradiction to Euler's theorem, which is quite nice at that point, because um, it's a complicated thing, it's in a current uh, publication, and uh, like the most recent results that's used in the proof of that lemma is uh, from the mid-18th century. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'd say um, that's it for this part of the proof. Of course, if you have further questions, feel free to ask. Right, let's first thank the speaker.